welcome to the town hall meeting. Uh, well, what a day it's been. Great news shared earlier today with the, the campus community regarding the university changing athletic conferences to the new Big East. And certainly the, the new Big East is going to benefit from the addition of Creighton, Butler, and Xavier to that uh, Catholic Seven, as they called them. And we all share similar passions for excellence on the court and also, importantly, uh, have similar academic profiles. And, and uh, uh, we'll see that that raises the stature of the institution as well. Now, as many of you noticed from uh, this morning's announcement, uh, Father Lannon is not in Omaha. He is in New York with the other nine institutions. So as a result, you get me. Uh, I'm Dan Berkey, Senior VP for Operations. Now, uh, presenting topics at today's town hall will be Gail Jensen and Tony Hendrickson on strategic planning, and John Wilhelm, who will give us an update on the uh, uh, campus development projects that are underway uh, on the campus currently. Next, I'd like to ask Kevin Burke of the Society of Jesus to uh, come forward for our opening prayer. For those of you who have not yet met Father Burke, He's Associate Professor of Systematic Theology at the Jesuit School of Theology at Santa Clara University. He is on our campus through the end of April as the holder of the Anna and Donna Waite Endowed Chair in Jesuit Education. Uh, something else of note, uh, Father Burke's sister, Dr. Eileen Burke Sullivan, is also a chairholder, that being the Barbara Reardon Haney Chair in Pastoral Lit Liturgical Theology. Father Burke. Good afternoon. I'd like to begin this invocation with a poem by the American poet Denise Levertov. It's entitled The Avowal. As swimmers dare to face the sky and water bears them, as hawks rest upon air and air sustains them, so would I learn to attain free fall and float into creator spirit's deep embrace, knowing no effort earns that all surrounding grace. Let us pray. O creator spirit, God of all life and movement, we are a people united by the mission of this university, sisters and brothers of a world that needs your deep embrace. Hear us and bless us. Hear the prayers of those who are hungry or alone, the cries of those who are bereaved or bereft of hope, the longings of all who call out to you. And hear our prayers, open our hearts to the sufferings of others, Open our eyes and ears to the challenges of our world. Open our lives to the needs of those entrusted to our care and make us instruments of healing and peace in this place and in all the places and communities where we belong. have one thing to say about the the new uh, conference and I know we're not supposed to take any sniping comments but you know I can bear this in fact and you can witness to it I've watched my last game with Valley officials so <laughs> there is a God <laughs> we, we tried to find a YouTube video but we decided just to have Tony here right so. <laughs> The, the process, as you know, we'll just, let us just recap for you real quickly the, the process that we've gone through in planning. We started off with uh, a, a large group of people that were involved in the planning process. We divided up into nine task forces to 
gather data, analyze data to get input from all areas of the campus, and that included uh, faculty, administrators, staff, people at all levels of, of broad cross section. As we took the initial data, we also realized that we needed to uh, uh, make some progress towards some specific goals. And so we had some initial goal work groups, and in those we actually augmented some of the people on the planning committee with expertise outside in finance or student services, admissions, wherever the, the goal was going to take us. And so we had those three work groups that gave us input, helped synthesize the, some of the data. We're now at a point in which we're trying to take, uh, you know, basically all of this data and collapse it down into something that we can make some sense out of in terms of goals and, and do some data reduction. Um, and we have some uh, items that we'll talk about a little bit here in terms of uh, student outcomes and some bridging and innovation. And the next step in the process will be to uh, align some of the, the units in the schools with those initial goals, get feedback and, and support from our board, and then go through the implementation. So that's the overall big high level 50,000 foot picture of the process. Yeah, it, it, actually this, this slide, if you think of the hourglass turns, turned uh, sideways uh, on its side is, is really what's happening is we're, we're moving this process from where we started with the broad funnel, or the opening of the funnel as we gather data from grassroots up and work through the, the nine uh, work groups task force and then we're, it has to go through this narrow part which is, which is the challenging part for us right now as we narrow down into uh, identifying objectives, which you'll see, uh, you'll see as we go through on these slides, uh, and working with the board to make sure we're on target in terms of the metrics. And then as we come back out with the strategic initiatives, you'll see how it, it'll blossom back out in terms of what the campus is, is going to do as we, as we move forward. Uh, and yeah, the, uh, <coughs> somebody changed our slides on us, imagine that. Uh, but <laughs> the, this, this should be more turned on its side. Like it should this. really <laughs> start with the, the bottom portion here uh, is the information that's flowing this way. And so we, we, we've started with the task forces and a, and a large funnel of data. We're now having to go through the narrow neck of deciding exactly what we're going to have to do, what are the, the major thrusts that we're going to do. We can't do everything. And then we'll feed that back out to the rest of the community. So. At this point, one of the things that we've, we've come to, to look at is, well, what's our overall promise to our constituency? What do we do as an institution? And this is a, a synthesis of the, the conversations we've had, and basically the promise to the students, to parents, to society, is that to realize the promise of a life well lived by sharing Jesuit values and bridging liberal arts, graduate, and professional education. So I want to give you a chance to kind of sit and ponder that and think about that for a moment. But uh, in, in a moment, we'll see the different constituencies. But that's the essence of what we really try to do. As, we've, as we listen to all those nine task forces, and we went through the work groups and tried to say, what you know, in a sentence, what is it that we do? This is really what uh, uh, we as an organization try to make as a promise to the rest of, of society and specifically to our students and, and to their families and then to our community. I, you know, I think that there's probably not, not any group that we've been in that we didn't hear. We always talk about, oh, we have this great complexity but yet we have this modest size. And I mean, this, this represents our complexity, uh, yet our modest size, which allows us to reach out and bridge with each other. Uh, it's our greatest asset and our greatest challenge. And, and we, <coughs> hope, we obviously hope that people will come here and go away with, with a very rigorous and, and positive professional uh, liberal arts education. We're grounded. Uh, certainly at the undergraduate level in a, in a broad liberal arts curriculum. 
We want people to be broad thinkers. We certainly bring Jesuit values to the table in all of our disciplines. And the purpose is to make them uh, competent professionals in their chosen fields. But even beyond that, our expectation is that those values with that professional competence will help them realize a, a life well lived. And, and frankly, that may be a little different for each individual. Some it will be meaning very financial success. Others will be the amount of people that they impact. But to, to whatever it means to those individuals, we hope to deliver on that promise. Yeah, um, related to this point of our complexity, our, you know, we're a comprehensive place, it, then how do we leverage or how do we build better bridges that allows us to engage in, in innovative academic endeavors, inter, you want, if you want to call it interdisciplinary opportunities. Uh, we've had a few of those uh, on the graduate side have been quite successful. We have one in, uh, on the undergraduate side with our uh, BILS program. Our, uh, and, and when you look out on the landscape in higher ed, you can't, uh, you can't help but notice almost every report that comes out talks about the importance of this cross-disciplinary work. It talks about the importance of, of preparing uh, uh, students and graduates that really have these elements of a Jesuit education. Uh, do, they, do they have a strong moral compass or grounding? Uh, can they, do they have good oral and written communication skills? Can they not only think critically, but use practical reasoning and bring those values in, in their ability to make judgments in uncertain conditions? I mean, the, or do, can they use multiple frames of reference? I mean, do they have those analytical skills? That's the, the importance of that bridge from the liberal arts to, to the other uh, disciplines. So how can we develop these bridges at Creighton? That's, and you'll see that's one of our strategic initiatives. How do we bring this forward in a way that's very intentional? So some of the criteria that we've looked at in trying to uh, identify bridges, and this is the point that we're, we're working on right now. We have a group, uh, a small group, trying to identify which bridges are the most appropriate, prioritize those bridges that we want to uh, emphasize first and foremost. And this is some of the criteria we're looking at. Clearly, uh, we, we have some driving principles that we, we know that we need to have more students. We're, we're looking for more support in terms of philanthropy and, and, and uh, uh, donor support. We're looking for more stature, things that will bring us more attention to help us be able to make that transition as a better, uh, higher profile, bigger reputation uh, academic institution. And so these are some of the criteria. It's clearly those things that have good cash flow that, that allow us to to be financially secure. Those things that we can do quickly will be uh, given attention more, higher priority than those things that will take several years to develop. Um, and so we're, we're wrestling with these criteria trying to decide which of those programs would be the most uh, likely and the best ones for us to tackle. And, and this isn't starting with a fresh slate. We're, 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 there was one task force that was uh, chaired by uh, Dr. Isabel Cherney that looked at interdisciplinary opportunities. So there's been a lot of legwork, groundwork done that we'll be looking at and will feed in, into these, these bridge, bridges. This is, this is the, um, uh, the process that we've been working. We, we have an outside consultant that's helped us with this, uh, a, 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 a company that's done about 350 strategic plans for different organizations for nonprofit organizations, for for-profit organizations, and this is kind of the, the worksheet model that they have, and this is the essence of our strategy. What you see here is at the top is where we define the audiences that we're gonna deal with. And so you see students and traditional, uh, traditional kinds of students and families, uh, professional students, employers, alumni, donors. We've even specifically identified Catholic health initiatives as, a, as an audience because they disproportionately represent a very targeted audience for us. And then we have the objectives that we want to reach. Below that is our promise that we have. And then what you see is, is, are the big initiatives. The, in blue there are the major headings. The imperatives are those things that we've identified that we feel that we must accomplish 
in order to be successful. Without, without accomplishing those imperatives, we can't even begin to accomplish some of the marketing mission identity or the bridging kinds of things. And so then the infrastructure are those projects that we will have to accomplish in order to meet the imperatives that we've identified. And so kind of working from the bottom up, these projects that we have should help us deliver this promise and reach these objectives with this group of audience. No, and right now we're focusing on the, as you can see, the innovation and bridge building strategic line is, is a pretty important one uh, in terms of it's, it's central to what are we going to do in terms of academic planning. Uh, if you look up at the objectives, if we're going to grow in enrollment, uh, then, then we've got to look at where those opportunities are. Uh, it connects to some of the online, the CLI Center, the online innovation. Um, what are we going to do with our EDGE program? That's the undergraduate to graduate professional pathway. Uh, to encourage students to uh, as they as they move through, uh, and then um, the health simulation center, which was has been discussed for quite some time, an important piece for our health sciences in terms of of, of current current and future uh, offerings. The other major ca categories that we're going to look at are m marketing areas, and then mission and identity, and you see the projects that are listed under those. Overall, what we're trying to accomplish as objectives are listed in these four items at the, at the very top under our audiences. To achieve a 5% revenue per year growth rate uh, by year three. And uh, to have a, a certain percentage cash flow, annual cash flow. We're yet to define exactly what value X will have, but we know that we need to have a certain uh, value for cash flow. We know that we need to grow our enrollments by some number, whether that's 2, 5, 20, we don't, we're, we're trying to figure out what the absolute number is, but we do know that we need to grow our enrollment by the end of year three. We need to know, we know that we need to grow our endowment, again, by X. We're, we have people working on the analysis to determine what those values are, but we know that that's something we have to do. And then finally, and this is probably the area that's uh, most complex for us, is determine, uh, come up with some measure of how we're doing relative to our students, relative to the quality. If you look at the, the, the other um, goals, they deal with getting more students, having financial support for those, being financially stable in our operations. Uh, but if we were doing all those things and our students were terrible, we wouldn't be successful. So. We have to have some measure that says, how are we doing in developing students? That will likely be a composite measure. Most of you have seen uh, the composite financial measure that we have uh, that, that Jan Matson has presented. This will be a similar kind of composite measure, one number that we'll, t that we'll be able to look at to say, you know, are we getting better or worse, maybe on a scale of one to 10? And we'll figure out how to uh, make that composite number uh, we'll, we'll activate it with a number of different components. And so it will include things like placement, um, uh, some measure of whether or not uh, we think we're delivering Jesuit values to our students, how, how we go about measuring that. Some measure about are our students being impactful in the community, are they becoming leaders? Um, some student life aspects, uh, uh, how well are they maturing? And, and that it will be a little bit tricky because we'll need to incorporate both uh, outcome components for uh, professional school students as well as undergraduate students. And there will be different, obviously different uh, measures for those students because there are different stages in their life. And what we're trying to do in developing undergrads may be different than what we're trying to do in developing uh, professional or graduate students. Um, but we think that we can come up with a, a single measure and index to do that. There are other institutions that have those, whether it's a, a balanced scorecard approach or some type of index approach. And we've looked at a number of those, and we will consolidate those together and come up with our own uh, kind of measure that we think will help us understand are we getting better or are we losing ground to what we're really trying to do with students.
So our immediate next steps are, are um, really to, uh, we're finalizing kind of what we have up at, at this level, enough to then feed this information to uh, each unit. And so each college uh, and operating unit will need to have uh, a similar kind of plan. And so, for example, in the College of Business, we've had a group working on strategic planning and they will take their input and come together and we'll try and come up with something um, similar for the college that uh, is kind of in this format, but that helps, identifies how the college is gonna help the university reach those goals. And we'll be looking for that from each unit. And we're just at the, at the point of trying to begin that kind of process. So we haven't done any of those, but we hope to have some examples of those to be able to be completed uh, in time for uh, presentation to the Board of Trustees at their June meeting. So that with the hopes that with some samples of how those individual units roll up into this, that this would be a plan that the board uh, could support and approve. Let me just sort of go off script here and make a couple of comments and observations. Tony can chime in here that it, it, many, most university strategic plans are pretty, pretty much platitudes. You could almost predict what they are. More mission, you know, more students, more academic excellence, yada, yada. But there's, there's, a, there's a change going on and that uh, higher ed is changing. There are many challenges. So what do you do strategically? And, and leadership is about strategy. Linking leadership with strategy is how good leaders lead. And as you know, Father Lannon is, is, is all about good leadership and strategy. So uh, Tony and I have had the blessing or maybe the curse of having to meet with the board planning subcommittee. Uh, this is a joint venture. The board is heavily invested in the strategic plan because it's central to the institution, to the vitalness of the institution fiscally as well as in terms of quality and excellence. So we've, we've had a uh, few meetings and the most recent meeting we had in March was with this one page plan. And they were very pleased because it spoke to them in terms that they see that it's addressing the issues that need to be addressed. It looks very much unlike what I've seen in my experience of university strategic plans, but a lot of strategic plans sit on the shelf and don't go anywhere. Uh, and it's not that strategic plans are not about, if I'm not in the plan, that means I don't count. That's not true. The, the strategic plans are about what does the organization need to do now and into the future. So. Yeah. I, I, I agree, and, and the no, board, I'm not a business person, so I don't. The board, you know, so. uh, uh, I think we were all pleased that, that the um, the sub plan, the planning subcommittee of the board uh, was very enthusiastic about the direction of uh, uh, of this one slide. If I can go back to. There, when we presented this. They were very enthused about what this represented because while this looks very, you know, one page, this represents the cumulative thought of thousands and thousands of hours of thought and work by those nine task force, by the three work groups, by hundreds of other people giving their input at, at a very granular level and then rolling that up into this and what that means. So. That's, that's the goal. And ideally what we're trying to do is with the, with the bridges is identify where those strategic connections are gonna be for us to uh, prioritize going into the future. Obviously, we, we are gonna have, still have each of these units and they will con continue to do what they do, but where are those opportunities for us to build those unique bridges that can bring us more students, more stature, uh, engage our, our alumni uh, and, and other kinds of donor bases, foundations and corporations would say, wow, that's a really unique kind of thing. Can we, can we be part of that? These circles really don't mean anything. I mean, these were just dra drafted up and the arrows don't mean anything either, so don't try to read anything into them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the graduate school sort of sits above, sort of hovers above all this, right? <laughs> And uh, finally, this is just the, the last slide to bring us back to an orientation that, we, you know, our university mission is 
the first foundation that we that we rest upon and our vision for the university and then the pillars that you see um, represented and they those pillars then support our initiatives and the objectives and our ability to then deliver on that promise so at this point I think that probably the the key thing is is uh, for you to kind of understand that but mostly to um, for everybody to kind of get this promise in their mind. That's, that's day in and day out what we're trying to do, is help our students mature, develop academically, socially, spiritually, et cetera, so that they can walk, go forth and live a life that's well lived and make a great impact on the world. Questions, I guess. We'll do that later, great. Good afternoon. Uh, now it's time to talk a little bit about noise, dust, and inconveniences. I'll spend a little bit of time on our campus development projects and just to back up briefly, last October the, the uh, Board of Trustees gave us permission to move forward with projects that involve relocating the College of Business to the Harper Center. Obviously in order to do that project we have a lot of other moves that take place, a lot of renovation of space I think in the uh, seven buildings. It amounts to about a hundred thousand square feet of renovated space uh, across those seven buildings. And then in addition, uh, we were given approval to start on the the new championship center, which is going to be the new basketball program. Also, the uh, student academic center, the training facility. I'll talk a little bit about those. And I do want to remind everybody that. A lot of this information is also available on a website we've created. For all website, search for campus development projects. You'll be led right into that. Okay. All right, can everybody hear me? All right. Has everybody witnessed a construction worker yet on campus? Okay. Uh, this might be hard to read, but I just want to tell you kind of what we've done uh, really since November through February. Um, it's impacted about 32,000 square feet in the following buildings. So for the most part in Epley on the second floor, uh, we've renovated that space. First of all, moving Tony Hendrickson's offices over to the Lobby building and then renovating that space for the College of Business Dean's offices. Um, if you look at the yellow portions, those are going to be classrooms on the second floor. And then Walsh Lecture Hall, which I think is a space that has not been used since I think 2000. Um, I went in there and there was a podium and there was a piece of paper on the podium and it was dated 2000. So uh, that space will be uh, used by Energy Technology um, next fall. So there'll be some lab space in there. Uh, we'll have other space in Epley that I'll touch on. If you look at, uh, to your right there, you'll see the Harper Center. Uh, we've completed some renovated space on the first floor of the Harper Center by moving central uh, reservations into the area, which was the fitness and also multicultural affairs is now located in that former area of the fitness and that they are in and operational and hopefully they're satisfied with that new space. Um, if you go down to the... Uh, the lower right there, the alumni library, we've really had three things go on there. We've worked with the library staff to bring in some compressed shelving. Um, so we've actually reduced the footprint of the old shelving that was on the second floor of the library. Uh, it's an automated system, uh, pretty, pretty sophisticated equipment, but uh, it's allowed us to gain some square footage and then build out for the EDGE program which will be moving uh, into that library space in uh, mid-April. And then also um, the registrar's office has moved into the UP room. And then lastly, in the old gym, at this point, we're, we're demoing the fourth floor. We'll start demoing the second floor, but we have moved the phonathon room uh, to new space on the third floor. Um, the additional activity over in Epley on the first floor uh, is, is not uh, too extensive. We've got a classroom that we'll work on on the first floor. 
and then we'll start now actually building out the um, the Walsh Lecture Hall and hopefully have that done in late July. This is the uh, fourth floor floor plan for Epley. So those will be faculty offices as they are today for business, but arts and sciences faculty uh, will be moving into that location and we'll add a couple classroom spaces on that floor. And then finally on the third floor, um, we'll be reconfiguring some of the existing classrooms into additional faculty office spaces uh, for uh, arts and sciences. What's really nice about Epley is that whole building will now be a College of Ar uh, Arts and Sciences building. It, it, it uh, allows them to be connected with the science building. It allows them to be across the quad for uh, humanities and Hitchcock. So I think it really gives them a nice centralized location. Uh, Creighton Hall, this is the former area in blue for the registrar's office and part of the dean's office from arts and sciences. This is where student life will be moving into and uh, that we should have that construction underway uh, probably next week and uh, that will run through about the middle of June. And then on the third floor of Creighton Hall, we'll be moving international programs to that location um, and we'll re rework the space that's uh, currently up there. I think history and um, modern languages groups are up there um, and we'll have that done over the summer. International programs will be the last group that leaves the Harper Center before we have it completely done for uh, College of Business. And then just to point out, we are doing a little bit of work over in Hitchcock to add some additional faculty offices in that building. On the old gym, um, the fourth floor is being completely re uh, renovated for student disability services. I know one of the areas that's up there that a lot of people attended was the do it training room we're now looking at moving the do it training function over to the lobby building and and trying to collaborate with the new creighton business institute which brings a lot of training uh, from outside of of uh, campus uh, onto campus so there'll be more information coming out on that and then the second floor of the old gym will will be used to support uh, the student support services group now Harper Center has several phases. Uh, we're gonna be kicking off um, some work to do around the admissions area. One thing, we're gonna be moving their reception area so that we can accommodate a new investment analysis center and a new finance classroom on that, on that second floor as you come in off the mall. So we're redirecting that admissions entrance farther down into the building. Um, and as you can also see, the uh, rotunda area, which is kind of that orange area, that will all be enclosed uh, with glass and we'll be moving the welcome desk out into that rotunda area. And that's gonna be fabulous space for some gathering, uh, hopefully uh, some soft seating, students can sit down there. It'll also tie into the coffee uh, brew day area. So th that'll be, um, a challenge to get this phase done because we still have a lot of things going on in the admissions area uh, and obviously we continue to have functions in the building. This is a quick look at if you're looking down at what that uh, welcome center is going to look like. Um, we'll have a nice uh, greeting uh, desk reception area, soft seating, and then you can see as it, as it moves to the back how that ties into the coffee shop. The other floors on uh, Harper, uh, as these occupants that are in there today move out, we'll be going in and we'll be putting uh, renovated space in for the dean's office and some additional faculty offices on the third floor. And then the last phase in Harper will be to finish off uh, faculty offices on the fourth floor. What we've been able to do with the schedule, initially we thought this was gonna be about an 18 month project involving all these buildings. We've been able to squeeze this down so that we can have the College of Business have all of their classes held in Harper uh, this coming fall semester and then basically be done with all of our buildings uh, hopefully right around the January of uh, 14. One of the more exciting projects I think is the uh, the work we're going to do around Brandeis. This will be um, 
the home for the registrar on the upper level. That's really the only space we're renovating inside the building is for the registrar's office. But when we had the opportunity to look at this, um, we kind of looked at a very old tired building. Um, and we do have a lot of deferred maintenance issues. We had some ADA issues. So uh, we, we took a, a, a clean look at this um, with an architect and um, this is kind of the new look. We're adding a tower phase that will basically uh, be on the north side of the building. And that's gonna accommodate an elevator and a expanded stairwell. And then we're gonna put a new skin basically around the whole building uh, with a, a more modern look. Uh, we're trying to incorporate some design from the east campus into this part of the campus with some of the brick but also try to you know, keep the architecture of Swanson and, and Daigleman. We're avoiding that yellow brick though. <laughs> so this will be exciting. This will get underway. Um, actually, some of the space the, the registrar will move into will be demoed in the next couple weeks. Um, and, but this will be a project that will run probably through October or early November. And that's how this will look. Uh, the other accommodation we're making uh, is for uh, coming out of Swanson. You can see we've added an ADA ramp. Uh, right now, the only ADA access out of Swanson is from the west side. So this allows students um, and, and uh, visitors and faculty and staff that need to get into Swanson, they can do that from, from the east side now and then also have access right into Brandeis with the, with the elevator. Okay, the championship center. Uh, this is also underway. If you've been over by the uh, Morrison Stadium, um, we've, we are uh, now digging and, and starting to work on a lot of the relocations that we have to do on the site. This is the latest illustration or schematic of what the building will look like. It's about 43,000 square feet. Um, inside the, uh, the gymnasium area, we'll have two practice, full-size practice. But this, again, also houses a lot of the functions that are currently over in the Vonardi Center in terms of a lot of the athletic support uh, services and functions. So this is the south side of the building. And uh, we're taking the opportunity. It, you may not be able to see it in these. But instead of windows, we're, we're using some metallic images on the south side of the, of the building. And these will be... Uh, uh, yet to be defined on what they look like, but uh, we think there'll be great opportunities for some branding and, and to really show some of the, uh, the history with the athletic program. This is how the building sits on the site. So we are going to be able to reclaim some of the green space on that north lawn um, between the California Mall and the building. And you can see that... Um, it really follows the line on the Webster Street Mall in terms of where the north side of Opus is today, the Ryan Center on the other side of it. So that we'll, uh, we'll expand that um, and make that a whole walk mall basically uh, uh, between 19th and uh, past Wareham. Rasmussen is not shown in there, but obviously that's, that's operational now. Got some um, opinions and some some talk that was made by some of the folks here in this room so let's take a moment to see what that's all about do you think Doug McDermott will go pro next year uh, yes after a year I'm gonna say he's gonna stay well my husband tells me he's going pro is Doug McDermott going pro yes he is so he's not gonna finish out college here he's going for the big bucks no, he's going to finish college, then he's going to go for the big box. Good answer. <laughs> Describe your average work day in one word. What would you say? Busy. Fulfilling. Challenging. It's great. Always changing. Two words. Ever changing. Ever changing. Your average work day in one word. What would you say? Uh. <laughs> Crazy. There it is. What's one thing you'd like to see our new provost, Ed O'Connor, implement when he comes to Creighton? I'd like to see more community events, bring the campus together, make us more one Creighton. What's one thing you'd like to see him implement? Okay, this is going to take me a minute. What is a provost? 
Um, for me, the provost position hasn't been defined yet. It would be interesting to see how it will change the culture of Creighton, but it is a culture change. What is a provost or what does a provost do? Well, a provost is kind of the assistant to the president. Hmm. hmm. You got me on the spot here. He's sort of a, um, an uber dean. What is a provost? I'm sorry? Isn't the provost the name that you call the crust when you cut it off of your sandwich? I was going to say it's a delicious Italian dish. <laughs> uh, provost? Provost. No, I have no idea. Well, I guess the provost is uh, the chief academic officer. A provost is the chief academic officer of the university. A provost is the chief uh, academic officer, so he's responsible for everything that happens academically on the campus. And what is your favorite spot on campus and why? Discuss Student Center. Oh, the Student Center. Scott Center, where all the food is. Third floor, east side of Harper. First place would be obviously the Kiwit Fitness Center. My second favorite place would be the Rasmussen Center. Kiwit Fitness Center or the Java J? I'd have to say the Jesuit Garden. Oh, geez, that's a good answer. Do uh, you want to change? <laughs> I'd go with the Jesuit Garden, too. Jesuit Gardens. Oh, uh, my favorite spot on campus is probably the, uh, the soccer stadium because uh, I like to go there and hide out. If you could change one thing at Creighton, what would you change? I like Creighton the way it is. I can't think of anything I'd want to change. I would change the, uh, the parking situation. I'd like to see considerable increases in funding for the libraries. I think just having more time like this to hang out with colleagues. More coffee shops? More coffee shops. Yes. Sometimes it's nice to talk to each other. If you were Creighton's president for a day, what would you do? Have a snow day. Give us all the day off so we can cheer on the Blue Jays in the NCAA. <laughs>
Uh, again, some of the key differentiators that were mentioned uh, earlier in the strategic planning discussion um, and opportunities to evolve our brand. On uh, legislative issues, um, I've heard people describe legislation kind of like making sausage. It's kind of messy, but you know, in the end you come out with something good. I'm not so sure that's always the case. Sausage tastes good to me. I'm not so sure that the legislation always does. Uh, but this is certainly the case with what's going on in Washington today. Um, I know uh, uh, Father Lannon and Chris Rogers, our Director of uh, Community and, and Government Relations, uh, recently came back from an AJCU legislative uh, breakfast and briefing in Washington, D.C. They met with our, our legislative um, uh, members of the Nebraska delegation, uh, expressed our concern and with respect to a number of items, and many of these are directly tied to the impact of sequestration, which is a word you probably didn't hear much about before, but it's certainly been in the news a lot uh, the last few months. I'll just touch on a few items. These are some of the areas you see on the screen where, where we anticipate uh, some level of impact. Uh, there's been a discussion about 2% reduction in, in Medicare, which certainly uh, could have an effect on our graduate medical education programs. Um, that uh, impact, that 2% reduction, goes beyond the, the um, uh, GME portion, the grad, graduate medical education, in, into the uh, indirect uh, medical education as well. So uh, some potential challenges there. On the student aid front, uh, some of this is still a little bit unclear. We do know that Pell funding, which is important to a lot of our students, uh, appears to be safe for the next coming year, but after that, it's, it's still uncertain. Uh, there are expected to be some cutbacks in the federal work study and the supplemental grant, the SCOG program, so uh, we're keeping a close eye on that. <coughs> Um, on the research front, uh, the National Institutes of Health um, is facing potential cuts of uh, a little over one and a half billion dollars in their programs. And, and although it's not exactly clear how that's going to flow, or it obviously is a concern of ours. It could, it could take the uh, form of delays in, in awards. It could be reductions in awards. But clearly, if that sort of a cut comes into play, it's going to have an impact. So more or less on the federal scene, we're, we're kind of just watching things very closely, communicating as we can with our representatives, um, and, and uh, uh, again, monitoring it very closely. Um, on the state front, <clears throat> a couple of items to, to note. Uh, to the uh, LB 439 is uh, a bill that increases the cigarette tobacco tax provisions, and, and just really briefly, uh, if that bill goes into effect, it would have the effect of almost doubling the amount of research funds that, that we get uh, under that program at the state. So obviously we're very supportive of that. Um, the second item, the College Choice Grant Program. Uh, this has been uh, a long-standing challenge for private higher ed in Nebraska. One of the, uh, really one of the lowest states in the nation in terms of support of private higher education. So. Um, I'll, I'll give you a couple of statistics here. You, you think about what, how that uh, can affect us uh, and all, the, all private higher edu education in the state. But uh, the uh, private, uh, the independent colleges and universities award a little over 40% of the baccalaureate and uh, graduate degrees in the state. And the students in those institutions get three-tenths of one percent of the aid that goes to higher education in Nebraska. So that, uh, the, on the plus side, I guess that, that means that there's not much there to cut, uh, but, but we've got a long way to go. Um, I, I think the, the, the bill is unlikely to be successful with the, based on the current uh, governor's opposition, uh, but it doesn't mean that we won't keep that on the agenda and keep pushing it forward uh, for the future. Um, so we have saved a little bit of time here for Q&A, so if I can have our panel group come back up and we'll try and take questions. Uh, one question is, will our season ticket prices increase? <laughs> yeah, I think the answer to that is yes. By how much and when, I, I don't know, but um, it, I think they've, they've increased over the years somewhat, but... Uh, 
clearly the, the quality of competition that we're going to see um, is going to be a step up from what we've had in the past. Um, how can we build a passionate partnerships campaign to fulfill Father's one Creighton vision? That's a great question. That's, a, that's, an, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and we've talked a little bit in leadership development programs about in, engaging in level uh, additional conversations uh, across divisions and, and becoming more engaged in, in, in those activities. Um, clearly that will help. I think the, the uh, bridge building activity that was mentioned to be part of the strategic planning initiative should help us with that one Creighton idea. The provost, uh, the institutions that have provosts, we have a chief academic officer, and it helps build, it helps unify across the academic units, Ken. So good leadership can do that. I want to remind everybody that, that we have a um, reception fo immediately following here. Uh, the next town hall is um, April 16th, so I'll put that on the calendar. More information will be coming out on that. Um, and then don't forget the uh, rescheduled uh, faculty and staff service recognition that was moved to April 1st from our uh, one of our snow days which somebody was asking for earlier. Okay, thank you.